Huh. Okay. Well. Hey, okay, so everyone, is everyone here now? Uh, did we all survive? Am I, am I back? Yeah, can everyone hear and see me? Awesome. Okay, so I think what we might do is just, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think what we might do is just ignore the whole session thing because uh, I, I don't want to go through that again. Um, for some reason, it would not let me broadcast from the second session, uh, but I'm now broadcasting from the third session. So we're just going to, it's going to be one big third session. Uh, that's how we're going to go. Um, let's see if we can get uh, the New York group on the team. All right, cool. So uh, it's been probably long enough. Uh, everyone, I'm sure, has gotten enough time to either get really scared and lonely or to finish the actual problems. So let's go ahead and take a look together uh, at how we how we identify all those. So uh, actually, let me log in here on my second machine just so that I can read the chat while I'm going full screen with you guys. Uh, let's see here. Okay. Uh, do, do, do. All right, perfect. Looks good. Okay, so let me jump on my screen here and time complexity. Cool. So can everyone see the uh, um, the text editor I've got here? Is that is that readable? Uh, I can actually full screen it. There we go. Okay, cool. So uh, this include function, this is, uh, so we you know, started easy and it gets harder at the very bottom. And so uh, it might take a little bit of time to explain how the really harder ones work, but this one, fairly simple. So this is, this is actually just linear search. Um, so I go you know, in this for loop, I go from left to right across this array. And if I find the element as I'm scanning through this array, I return true. So this thing right here clearly must take um, O n time because you know, the size of the array is n, and that's clearly the input. I'm iterating over each element in this array. Um, so this include function takes on time. So that's pretty easy. So this right here would be, uh, say, on. Okay, uh, so what about this one, uh, is middle element? And so that just checks to see if the target uh, that I pass in is the middle element in the array. Well, so here, what we got is some math going on here. So we divide the array length by two, and then we just take the floor of it, uh, because JavaScript doesn't have integers. Um, and then we check to see if the array at that index is equal to the target. Well, if you remember, uh, you know, accessing something in an array, this is a one time. We said that earlier, and I kind of hand waved it a little bit. Hopefully we'll get to talk about why that is. Uh, but that takes a one time. So this whole thing, this math in here, and the actual uh, equality check. Um, the equality check is also a one time, and the getting the thing out of the array is a one time. This whole thing is a one. Well, if anyone has questions, feel free to ask, um, and I'll give you the best answer. Okay, so now we got max. So this is like just finds the max element in the array. So it starts with this, you know, uh, starts takes the first element, presumes it to be the current max, uh, we got an old trusty for loop, right? So this must take at least O n time. Question is, how long does the stuff inside the for loop take? Uh, well, this is just like a, a conditional check. A conditional check takes O n time. Uh, and then we do a we, you know, we do a get here inside of array, array lookup, that's also O one. And then, you know, setting a variable or initializing a variable uh, is also O one. And so this whole thing is, O1 inside here, O1 here, O1 here, and this O n loop. So the O n loop multiplies by the O1 inside. So one times n, of course, is n. Uh, and so this whole thing gets dwarfed by the for loop. And we just say this is O n. Uh, and so actually, if you have an unsorted array, it, any function that takes the max of a of an array, uh, if you assume you don't know anything special about you know sort of elements are randomly ordered, um, the best you can do is O n. Uh, and you can give a kind of reasoned argument for that, why that's the case. Uh, there, there's no better algorithm that can get the max uh, of an unsorted array faster than O n time. Uh, and the reason why that is is because I can, I can sort of make a, um, a principled argument in that 
for uh, something to be, if, if it didn't take one time, that means it, uh, because to look at something in an array takes a one time, right? To do, you know, uh, R of I, to look at something in an array, this uh, takes a one time. So if I don't look at, you know, to, to not take on time means I don't at least look at everything in the array. Because to just look at everything in the array takes O1 times N, so O N time, to look at everything in the array. So if I don't look at everything in an array, so basically means there must be something I didn't look at. If there's something I didn't look at, and the array is sort of randomly ordered, and I don't know what it is, how do I know that the thing I didn't look at isn't the max? There's no way to know for sure, right? It could always be that the one element I decided not to look at was the max. So I have to at least look at every element to know for sure I found the max. And if I look at every element, then the lower bound on that is on. And I've just shown you a function that computes the max in on time. Uh, and that's basically the way that you prove that an algorithm is optimal. You can show the lower bound for this is on, and I have an algorithm that's on, or, you know, and log n or whatever, uh, then that means that the algorithm you have found is quote unquote optimal. Now, obviously, I didn't provide a proof, uh, sort of, you know, kind of more of a loose, kind of fuzzy uh, proof of, of sorts, um, but even that is probably sufficient to, you know, I, I hope, uh, oops, delete that, um, give you a sense of like why I'm confident that this is like an optimal solution for Max. Um, yes, actually, that's one thing that we didn't talk about. Uh, that's good, I should probably augment the slides to talk about that, is that in uh, big O runtime, we are, sorry, in big O analysis, we only talk about worst case running time. We don't talk about best case. We sometimes do talk about average case. Uh, and I'm gonna kind of conflate the two a little bit. Um, but generally speaking, we'll talk about worst case. So actually you might notice like in this include function, right? There's actually an early termination here. There's like this early return true. Uh, it could be that if every time you run this include function, the target that you're looking for is always exactly the first element in each array that you're searching through, then this will just return, like it doesn't matter how big the array is, it'll always return as soon as it finds the element which will be the first element, right? So you could argue like, well, you know, if given certain inputs, uh, actually this thing would be O1 time. But the way we analyze big O is always in terms of the worst case, okay? We analyze in terms of the worst case because we wanna give some kind of guarantee of like, you know, uh, the space shuttle will never crash. Because like the worst, you know, we, we can assume everything goes wrong, uh, you know, like all the O-rings, whatever, like all that stuff goes badly. Uh, this is the worst that could possibly happen if, you know, the gods are just aligned against you and they want your computer to run slow. Um, and so if you protect against that worst case, if things run faster than you expect, it's usually not a problem, although it sometimes is. Uh, but it's usually not a problem. But if things run slower than you expect, that can be a huge problem. Uh, and so that's why we always think about worst case when we talk about scalability and when we talk about big O. So this include function, we would think about the worst case. And the worst case is if the target is not in the array. If the target is not in the array, then it's got to scan the entire array from start to finish and then return false. Um, so we sort of kind of trace the worst case path through the algorithm. And that's what we call the, the big O. So a uh, very, very good point, Bart. I, I neglected to mention that. It's a very important part of big O analysis. So uh, any questions on those, uh, on those three before we move on? <clears throat> okay, cool. So these, these are pretty simple. Uh, let's go to the moderate cases. So these are a little bit tougher. Um, so first one here is substrings. Okay, so this is, this is the algorithm that generates all of the substrings of a string. So if you don't know what a substring is, um, uh, we can actually uh, just do, yeah, actually, we can, we can like just run this code. Um, so actually, let me, Da, 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 da. What am I doing? Yeah, let me change the. Give me one second here. Let me change what I'm sharing. Uh, so screen share, entire screen. Let's get some craziness going here. Okay, cool. All right, uh, and let's go into Node, and let's just paste this function, and I'll show you uh, here substrings of hello, uh, and these are here all the substrings of hello. So basically, that just means like all of the um, you know, well, substrings, right? All of the strings that could be created out of parts of this string. Um, so that's all that substrings does. It, it, it finds every single string that could potentially be created within this string. Uh, so sort of slices of the string, you might imagine. And 
Now you'll you'll notice too that the algorithm that I'm using is two for loops, right? Two nested for loops, and each of the for loops goes up until string dot length. So clearly, because string is the input, uh, it must be that the algorithm or the, you know, the way we quantify n here should be the length of the string, because there's no real other way to do it. Um, so we're we're counting by the length of the string, and you know we are we're pushing into this array. Uh, array pushing we establish as one time, so that's fine. Um, <clears throat> And uh, this right here, um, this loop is O n. This loop is O n. So whatever happens inside here must be n squared time. Um, so that's you know it's, it's interesting. Okay, so uh, whatever's in here is happening in one squared time. So pushing something to an array is O one. So maybe it's n squared or n times n times one. But actually, the string dot slice takes extra time. Okay. Uh, and the string dot slice takes time. Uh, so actually, this should have been really been advanced. I don't know why I put this in moderate. This is pretty complicated. Um, but the string dot slice here, that's like nested inside this pushing, this is actually the thing that takes extra time. So because in JavaScript um, you create, uh, so JavaScript it does have copy and optimization, uh, which is a whole other thing. But uh, basically, the way you can understand this is that this actually takes an average, the length of an average substring. Okay. Uh, because the to, you have to create a new string uh, and then you know throw it into an array. Uh, if you ignore copy and write optimization, that's how much time this thing takes. Um, so this takes uh, time proportional to the length of the average uh, average substring. How long is the average substring? Who knows? That's a really hard question. How long is the average substring? It turns out you can mathematically prove the length of the average substring is about one third n. Um, asymptotically, it approaches one third n, uh, but it's pretty easy to intuit that, like, clearly it grows with the size of the string because the average size, uh, you know, the average size uh, substring, like a giant string that's 10,000 characters long, is going to be longer than the average size of a substring of a string that's really short, like hello. Right? All those strings are going to be really short. Whereas if the string is like the Declaration of Independence in a string, the average substring of that is going to be quite a bit longer. Uh, it turns out it scales linearly. So this right here. Uh, this right here is uh, linear time. So what you have here is this quadratic doubly nested looping, and inside of it you have a linear time uh, copy or creation. It's this dot slice. So this whole thing ends up being uh, on cubed. So this is a cubic algorithm, actually. Uh, so it's, it's quite slow. But it's quite slow because this is actually, it turns out this is the optimal way to generate all the substrings. Um, and I can, and again, I can, I can, I can prove that. Uh, the the way to intuit why this is optimal, like why this is the lower bound, the lower bound is O n cubed. I can give you an argument for why that is. So you wanted me, you know, this function is asking me to construct an array of all of the substrings of this string. Well, I know that there are quadratically many substrings. There are O n squared many substrings because the substring is defined by. Let's say I have a string like hello. Okay, uh, the substrings are defined by each substring is like a unique start index. And end index, right? So HELL is a unique substring. And then, you know, ELLO is a unique substring. And ELL is a unique substring. And the way those things are unique is because they start and end at different indices, right? If they both started and ended at the same indexes, then they would not be uh, unique substrings. So they'd be exactly the same substrings. Um, so that is a doubly nested loop because it's like all the first indexes and then all the second indexes, okay? Uh, so that's a doubly nested loop. That means there are quadratically many substrings. So uh, you want me to write an algorithm that produces quadratically many things. It must be at least quadratic. Because to generate quadratically many objects, obviously I need to do something at least quadratically many times. So that's, that's the quadratic part. But how do I get to cubic from that? The way that I say that I know for sure that substrings must be cubic is because output, though, is not just an array with like a bunch of shallow objects in it. It's not just like an array of you know, uh, little tiny numbers. It's an array of strings. You want me to produce an array of strings. And the average length of that string is going to be proportional to n. Because I you know, told you to describe that proof to you earlier, uh, but you can also just kind of intuit it, that, that fact that the average length of a substring is proportional. Okay. So you want me to create this output that is an array of a bunch of strings on average size n. To initialize an array of uh, a string of size n is around n. Oh, I'm sorry. The audio seems to be breaking. Um, can people hear me okay? Uh, I can like... 
we stop for a second and hope things repair? Sounds good. Okay, great. Um, yes, so uh, because I can say the average of a string is O n, and the uh, the number of strings is going to be quadratic, you want me to initialize quadratically many strings, so n squared many strings, of average length proportional to n. Therefore, the output you want me to create takes cubic time to initialize. Uh, so yeah, if your output died, maybe try refreshing. Uh, is everything breaking? Uh, this, this sounds really bad. I'm, I'm worried. Uh, okay, some people hear something. No, what's going on? Okay. <clears throat> ah. Okay. Uh, am I back? Can people people hear me again? Okay. Uh, is that any better or am I still robotic? Okay, excellent. Uh, yeah, please let me know if that happens again. I'll go ahead and do the same thing I just did, and hopefully that uh, resolves the problem. Okay. Um, all right, I'm trying to share my screen, but it's taking a little bit of time. There we go. Okay. All right, so uh, basically, I, I'm not going to belabor it any further because I think that we hopefully uh, most of us get the idea. Um, but essentially, that is uh, why this thing, uh, this substrings method takes O n cubed time. And that's my intuition for why I believe that this is optimal. So the output must be at least size O n cubed. So to build that output, it must take the at least cubic time. And this algorithm is cubic time. Um, so that is why I believe this is optimal. Cool. Oh, whoops, I wanted to delete that. Okay. So uh, that was actually super advanced. I don't know why I had that in the uh, uh, the middle one. Um, uh, so, okay, so Danny asks, why is substring, so uh, substring basically meaning, I think she's referring to string.slice, he or she. Uh, since we know the number for i and the number for j, I would think there'd be two constant lookups. Um, so it's a good question. Um, so what I am uh, assuming here is, and actually this is not, it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, if you're curious about learning more, you should look into what's called copy on write optimization. Um, I'll type it out in the chat for those who are interested. Copy on write optimization. Um, but basically, what you can think about is even though I'm only feeding in these two constant numbers, so you know, string dot slice ij, uh, what this has to do is generate a new string, right? It creates a new string object uh, that is a slice of the string from here to here. Um, okay, so Gregory now says he's getting bad audio as well. Oh man, this is not, this is not good. Um, hmm. Okay, some say audio is okay, some saying it's coming and going. Um, is what I'm saying intelligible to everybody right now or is it not good? Okay, cool, okay. Uh, if it's unintelligible, let me know. Uh, there's probably, yeah, I have pretty much everything off. Um, there's uh, unfortunately not a lot that I can do if the audio is choppy, but if it's like going out, let me know and I'll like reset. Um, cool, okay, so yeah, so because this initializes a new string, uh, so it literally creates like you know a new string and it, whatever, it has to copy this somewhere into memory uh, to create this new string. Uh, and that copying must take O n time to like have this new string live somewhere else. Um, so that's kind of what I'm uh, sort of counting on. Uh, that's why I say that slicing a string is actually O n time and not one time. Um, but if you look at the copyright up, copy on write up optimization, you'll see it's a little bit more complicated than that. Um, but yeah, let's not worry about that. Cool. So uh, first five. Uh, so this function just returns the first five elements in an array. Okay. Um, so here we've got a for loop, telltale sign of O n, right? Telltale sign of something that's linear. Um, actually, no. Actually, no. Because you can see this thing only counts up to five. Right, and five is a constant number, and this results array uh, it certainly gets stuff pushed into it, but it only gets pushed into it five times. So this result array can be at most, um, well, it, can, it will always be size five. You will have five things in it. Sometimes it'll, I guess it'll have undefined if the array is too small, um, but it'll only have five elements in it. So this first five function takes o one time. Um, so, you know, this is probably unsurprising if you really have a deep understanding of what O1 really means, but this, this thing will take O1 time. Uh, it doesn't matter how big the array is, 
uh, remember what Owen means. Owen means it doesn't depend on the size of the input. So even though there's a loop, even though you know stuff's happening repeatedly, um, doesn't matter if the array is size 5,000, 5 million, 5, uh, this function will take the same uh, amount of time. It's not going to depend on the size of the input. Cool? Okay, uh, so now we've got these advanced ones. So uh, these are, uh, honestly, these are probably less advanced than the, <laughs> than the substring one, but that's fine. Um, okay, so this one is integer division, uh, this first one here. Uh, is anyone not familiar with integer division? Uh, a lot of, uh, many other programming languages. Okay, how are we? Is that any better? Oh, do I have a hardware connection? I don't think I do here. Uh, I'm in the office right now. And uh, let's see here. Okay, is is the audio okay now? Or is it still not so good? I'm sorry for all the technical difficulties, folks. This is uh, unfortunate. Okay, so it's, it's good for the moment. Um, we're going to roll with that. Okay. Mm. Let me try. Uh, okay, if I if I undo this, I don't know if that will make a difference. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, okay, let's let's just keep moving, and uh, unfortunately, we'll just have to make do with what it is. Okay, so I'll go back to the screen share uh, and share my screen here. And okay, let's jump into this. Um, all right, so. Uh, let result equals zero. Okay, so basically this is doing integer division. And integer division is essentially, um, you know, instead of, so in JavaScript, all division is float floating point. All numbers are stored as floating point numbers. Um, and floating point numbers are generally, you can't store as much. Uh, well, they're, they're just different than integers. I don't want to go into too much into the difference between floating points and integers, but integers, like as a native data type, can't store decimals, uh, but floats can. Uh, but floats tend to have come with their own share of problems, basically. Um, so most programming languages will have integer division for integers, and floats is like a totally different data type that have their own form of division. So if you divide two integers, so for example, if you divide 7 by 2, uh, you don't get 3.5. Instead, you get 3, uh, because you get like 3 with a remainder of 1, and you get that 1 by using modulo, uh, which probably most of you are familiar with uh, the modulo operator. Um, so... This is just an integer division algorithm. It's a very simple one. It's uh, very far from optimal. A lot of the algorithms I'm going to show you are not optimal. Um, some of them are, uh, like the ones I showed you earlier. But um, this integer division algorithm basically here, um, essentially what it does is like, let's say I'm dividing, uh, well, let's do here. Let's say I'm dividing you know, seven divided by two. Um, what it'll do is it'll repeatedly subtract two. So it'll just, you know, subtract two from seven, and it'll get five, and it'll get three, and it'll get one. Uh, as a remainder, it'll say, oh, okay, so seven goes into two three times. Right, and then it returns a result. So uh, you might wonder, okay, so what's the um, what's the time complexity here? Right, how long does this integer division algorithm take? Um, so there is like a loop here, but this loop runs. You know, how many times does this run? Like, so clearly, like you know, subtracting, uh, comparing, uh, adding to a variable. These are all O one time. These are all really fast. Um, but uh, you know, it, the the number of times this thing runs might not be obvious, right? So like it, whatever this outer loop is, it must be multiplied by O1. So it's just the, the time that this outer loop runs. And the way you describe that is actually what you'd say is like, well, this outer loop must run the number of times that the denominator goes into the numerator, right? Because that's literally what I'm doing. I'm just counting up the number of times it goes in. So this would be O of N divided by M. Uh, that would be the runtime of this integer division algorithm. Now, it is a little bit more complicated than that, and if you are being very technical with computer science, uh, you would actually say that it's exponential in both n and m because n and m are just numbers. Excuse me. n and m are both numbers. <coughs> Sorry, I'm a little bit sick. Uh, n and m are numbers, and numbers, uh, it doesn't take, uh, the way that numbers are represented is by bits. Right, so like the way that I store the numerator is by a number of bits. So if I, for example, have the number eight or the number sixteen, uh, that would be like one zero zero or one zero 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 to store the number sixteen. Um, uh, uh, so to have um, 
I might have missed a zero there. So to have uh, you know something something that scales proportional to the actual number that's represented by all the bits, uh, we would say that's actually exponential in the number of bits. Um, so this is a pretty complicated concept. If that doesn't make sense, don't worry about it. Uh, it's fine to just say that this is n o over n divided by m. Um, but if you wanted to be super technical, you would actually say that this is exponential uh, in the size of the inputs because the inputs are actually bits, they're not numbers necessarily, right? Like the size of the input, if I'm storing the number 10,000, uh, doesn't, I'm not actually storing uh, my input size, like the size it takes to represent that input, is not 10,000 of anything. It's actually log base two of 10,000 because I'm storing, I'm actually, the input is literally just bits I'm giving you. Uh, and the number of bits is less, way less than 10,000. It doesn't take 10,000 bits to represent the number 10,000. Um, that's why you'd actually say this is exponential. But for all intents and purposes, you can just say this is n divided by n. Um, okay, let me quickly look back here. Uh, whoops. Okay. Uh, is audio completely gone? Oh, it's back. Oh boy. Okay. Um, excellent. All right. Let's keep. Let's keep moving. So uh, I'm gonna try to run through these pretty fast. Uh, so this has val function. This is uh, kind of interesting. So what it does here is it checks to see if a string has a val in it. Um, and so what it does is it splits uh, a string into an array of characters, uh, and it checks to see if any character is a val. And the way it does that is it has like this list of all the vowels, uh, and it checks to see if the index of uh, you know, if you write JavaScript, you're familiar with this. Uh, the index of the character is basically negative one. It means that it's not in there, right? So it's asking, is there any, uh, is there any character in the string that if I looked up, if I looked up the index of that string in this, the index of that character in this string, uh, it would not find it. So uh, splitting the string, that means I do something for each character, right? So uh, I'm, I have this callback for each character here. This, uh, this this anonymous function. And this thing right here, the question is how long does this thing take to run? So you might think, well, it's an index of, so it's like doing a linear scan to see you know, where this thing is in this, uh, in this string. But this string is always a constant size. And that's the really important part. There are only five vowels. There will always and forever be five vowels. So anytime that I'm checking to see if this thing is included in an array or you know, a string that's size k, where k is a fixed number, um, that is O of K, meaning O1. So even though I'm doing a linear search of an array or a linear search of a string, uh, that string is a fixed size. So this actually, this, this whole callback inside here uh, takes O1 time. And so even, th so this whole thing takes O N time because this callback gets called O N times, the thing inside is O1, so this whole thing is O N. Uh, let me see if I can jump back into the Crowdcast now. Cool. Okay. So uh, that thing is on. And then finally, this is substring. So this one is the, tri uh, I think probably the trickiest one. Um, this one here is, uh, this one here is on. And, or I'm sorry, not on. Uh, well, yeah, it turns out it's on. But uh, the way I'm going to demonstrate to you why it's on is because, you know, so if you, if you follow what this is doing here, um, the way that it checks that the thing is uh, that this function is O n is because um, you know well let's just follow this let's follow this algorithm literally so we'll say a string that's, the string is hello and I'm checking to see if hello is a substring of this string okay so the first thing it does is it checks to see okay if the substring you're looking for checking to see if it's the substring of a string is uh, longer than the string then clearly this is not a substring of that string so go ahead and return false. Um, if the first, uh, you know, substring length many characters, so this substring length is two, right? If the first two characters, so this right here is our string. If the first two characters are the substring, then uh, like they're, if they're equal, so H is equal to LO, then return true, then clearly it is a substring. Um, I'm sorry, uh, is it not, let me uh, do this here. Okay, is that better there? Oh, uh, let me see if I can get rid of that. Yeah, there we go. Okay, sorry about that. Is that better, folks? Yes, sorry about that. Okay, so uh, the first two characters will be HE and LO. Those won't match, so it'll do the third line, which is return is substring, string.slice from one, uh, and string.slice from one basically means uh, to the end. 
Um, uh, yes, Patrick, uh, two lowercase is constant um, because, uh, well, where's the two lowercase? Oh, the two lowercase is here because it's just one character. So two lowercase and one character is always going to be constant because the size is only one character. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, so then we check to see is the substring, uh, is this function going to return true for this minus one? So that's literally what happens. So, okay, cool. Now we see this is not true because the string length is greater than LO. Let's work through this whole thing together. Okay, let's like follow the recursive function. Uh, whoops, let me get this down. Okay, so string dot slice. Uh, so we check to see if the first two characters match. They don't, okay. And then it does this recursive call uh, where string is now one character less because it's string dot slice is one. So now the call stack, we're three calls, three calls deep. Um, this is not true. Uh, so we do this, we check to see if the first two characters match, LL match LO, no they don't, uh, so we kill one of the characters in the next recursive call, and now finally they're equal of course, so this will still not be true, um, and then this will activate, because this right here, and this right here, match, and so this whole thing will return true, the true will bubble all the way up, and this thing will return true, okay? So, what you can, what you can probably see as I've shown you this, is that the is substring function uh, will call. Uh, um, sorry, the is substring function will get um, called o n many times. Right? There will be in the worst case where uh, n is the length of the string. Um, there will be n many calls to is substring because each time we chop off one letter and we check to see if it's a substring. Right? Um, so this right here is o n many recursive calls. So we say. Uh, o n recursive recursive calls. Now the way that you analyze the big O runtime of recursive algorithm is slightly different from the way you'd analyze just like a straightforward uh, iterative algorithm. Uh, and the way that you generally do it is you count the number of recursive calls and then the average amount of work inside of the uh, recursive call. So basically if we ignore this line right here, how much work do these two lines take? Right? So this line here is clearly going to be O1. Um, so that's fine. And this line here is actually not going to be a 1. And I'm going to show you where it's not a 1. So here, this uh, return true, that's a 1. Uh, this this conditional check, though, or sorry, this string dot slice, this is not a 1, right? We talked about this before. It's uh, cutting, a p it's cutting a string and creating a new string out of a substring, uh, or creating a new substring out of a string we already have, right? So creating this HE takes time proportional to the length of the string which will be, because it's zero to substring dot length, it will be the length of the substring. So if we have two, in, we have two inputs here, we have n and m, and so this becomes, this line right here becomes om, because we have to slice the string, right? Uh, that takes om time. And then to actually compare two strings actually takes also om time. String comparison is not uh, o1. Comparing numbers is o1, but string comparison is not o1. Uh, because you have to look at each character of the string one by one uh, to check to make sure they all match, right? So actually, uh, if the strings are the same except for the very last letter, you'd have to scan through both of them left to right all the way to ascertain that they're both uh, different. So that's why string comparison is OM, uh, or o -O -L, I guess, or L is the length of the string. Um, so this, creating the string is ON, and then, or sorry, OM, where M is a substring, and then comparing them is also OM where M is a substring. So there's two operations there, they're both uh, M. So you have this O2M thing inside there. Uh, we'll just call it OM. Uh, and so, we, so we've established now, this is O1, so we can ignore that. This is OM, and this is ON. This ON, uh, or this recursive call, happens ON many times. So basically everything in here happens ON many times. So we can almost imagine this as being like a nested loop that runs ON many times. But if that runs ON many times, then we multiply the N and M together and this whole algorithm becomes O n times m. So this is actually a quadratic algorithm. Uh, and this is, this is known as string search, this uh, is substring thing. Uh, and this is like sort of the naive string search. Uh, the, you can do string search in linear time, so it would be n plus m uh, for the, the ideal optimal approach to searching. Um, but this algorithm is pretty crappy, uh, and this is quadratic. Um, <clears throat> okay, so uh, there are some questions in the chat. Let me answer those quickly. Uh, so uh, somebody's asking about, uh, let's see here, the split here. 
So the question is, how long does the split take? So this uh, string.split takes O n time because it creates a new array. It creates a new data structure that has a bunch of strings in it that are length one, right? Um, so that's a one array that is full of n many character single strings. Uh, so, so splitting would be O n. Um, <clears throat> now the sum, the dot sum, so you might think like, well, if splitting is O n, don't you multiply that by the dot sum? But no, the dot sum runs O n times because it runs once for everything in the in this array. Um, but we established that the dot sum, like this is just like a for loop, right? Inside the for loop is an O n operation. So we've got this O n and we add another O n. Exactly, Brian, you got it exactly right. Uh, we split only once and then we do a dot sum only once. So you add the two together. So it's n plus n. Uh, so that becomes 2n, which reduces to on. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Okay, cool. So uh, the question about the is substring. Um, so Brian, uh, don't worry if your head hurts. Um, it'll, 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 it'll make more sense. And maybe if you review it afterwards, uh, it'll be uh, more intuitive. So Brian asks, for this one, I thought it's n minus m recursions. Uh, and inside, there's a slice slash compare that costs 2m. Uh, and a slice uh, in a recursive call also costs n. Okay, uh, so good, good, good question. Good, good, very good uh, call out there. So you're right. It's actually n minus m recursions, um, and so this would actually technically be um, n. So if you if you're doing the the uh, big O here, it would be uh, n minus m for the number of recursions uh, times two m, right? So if you distribute this here, then this would become two uh, n times m minus or two n m uh, minus to 2m squared, okay? Um, now, the the thing here that, so you remember we talked before about like you can't all, if you have two inputs, you can't assume that one dominates the other. Um, uh, what are the cost of n of the slice in the recursive call? Um, oh, actually, you are, uh, you are correct. Uh, yes, so this is substring. Um, so yeah, so I guess if we're ignoring copy and optimization, then this also takes o n time. Um, so each, uh, yeah, actually, you're totally right. So, very good point, Brian. Uh, so this, because we're slicing the string, um, this actually does take O n time. Uh, so this whole thing becomes n n many recursive calls, uh, n co n plus m cost per recursive call. So this would become two n times m. So it becomes an even more gnarly thing. Um, now, actually, we can remove that if we're a little bit smarter about like just throwing, like basically passing down indexes, so we don't have to keep creating new arrays by slicing. Um, so there's a way to get around that. Uh, I don't want to rewrite the function to do that because then it gets more gnarly, but we can get around that. So just sort of trust me that uh, the ideal way, the ideal naive way to do this is upstring would be not actually creating a new string, but just like passing down the offset that you're sort of looking, comparing them by, uh, and then recursively going down. If that makes sense. Uh, if it doesn't make sense, don't worry about it. But let's pretend that this was the runtime. It was n times m, n minus m times 2m. Uh, this is how we would distribute. But remember, the string is always bigger than the substring, right? So because we have two inputs, we really actually don't care about the m part, other than that like, it sort of multiplies by the n part, right? So like, for example, this is basically quadratic in n times m, uh, because it's, you know, n times, you know, if, if m is small, that's fine, but n will always be bigger than m. Like it must be, otherwise it'll just immediately return. So because n is always bigger than m, uh, it's sort of quadratic in n times m, n quadratic in m. Um, this one is the only one that matters because m is n is always strictly bigger than m. So this is at least m times m, but n will often be much bigger than m. So basically, we can ignore this part. Uh, this part does not contribute to the big O uh, because we we'll, we will say that n dominates m when you're doing like this substring query. Yeah. Uh, so that's why you would say this is O n times m. Cool. Uh, any final questions before I move on? Uh, but this this is definitely a tough one. So like if this is like oh my god I don't understand it. Uh, that's why it's advanced. That's why it's on the that's why it's on the hard side. Um, but it's nice to kind of try to reason through these things and make sense of uh, what exactly is going on in these algorithms. So are we all cool. Thumbs up. Down. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Uh, doing is substring. So yeah, it, doing is substring with index of is actually linear. Uh, so it's linear with the two, um, 
Actually, oh, you know what? I'm not completely sure. So here's what I'll say. I do know that string search is uh, on, and as I guess that probably uh, in JavaScript, uh, index of is going to be on, or not on, but rather on plus m, where m is the length of the substring. Um, so that's like any optimal string search algorithm uh, is going to be is going to be linear time. I assume that that index of is optimized to use string search algorithms, um, but I could be wrong. Uh, I, I, it'd be surprising to be wrong about that because it's defined on the string, but um, I'm, I'd say, you know, 99%, it probably is linear because uh, if you use like a regex, for example, that will be definitely linear because they use uh, optimizations to make that linear time. All right, cool. So uh, let's move on. Okay. So uh, optimizations don't always matter. Okay. Uh, this is the next thing that we're going to talk about as we talk about Big O, uh, and we really start looking into how you know, this stuff plays out in the real world and like how to optimize code and make it more efficient. Because that's really what we care about, right? Is making code fast. Um, this is just because it doesn't always matter. I, I, I saw this link. I don't know. I don't know how I found this yesterday, but I, uh, I, just, it, I was like, I, I, need, I need an image here. And this is the only thing I can find. Uh, okay, so let's talk about bottlenecks. Uh, so a bottleneck is a part of your code where your algorithm is spending most of its time. Okay. Um, so basically, you can kind of think about it like asymptotically, it's wherever the dominant factor is. It's wherever most of the looping is happening. It's wherever like the n squared is. That's that's the bottleneck. That's where like you know, uh, yeah. So a good example is like let's say you have an O n algorithm. Uh, you have an O n part and then like an O fifty part and then a constant part of it. Uh, your bottleneck is the O n part. That's where your algorithm is spending most of its time. Um, and the important thing is that as n goes to infinity, like basically as the input gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, your algorithm will eventually spend almost all of its time in the bottleneck, right? And you can kind of intuitively see this, uh, is that you know, if you have an on algorithm uh, and there's like an on in the constant part, as n goes to you know, 10 billion, almost all of the time is going to be spent in the loop and not in the stuff outside the loop, right? Because that's just where 99% of the time is going to get spent. Um, so you know, a good example of that is, um, so if I... We go back to the, uh, what was it? Uh, oh, what was the n squared? Uh, there was one, what, what was the n squared algorithm? I guess we didn't have one. Oh, I guess this is the n squared algorithm. Um, but yeah, the idea is that like most of the time of this algorithm is actually going to be spent in these two operations right here, um, where you're creating strings and comparing them. Um, and so that's going to be your bottleneck. Uh, wherever you're spending most of your time, that is your bottleneck. And the important thing is that when you're trying to optimize an algorithm, or trying to speed it up, or you know, whether it be a web app, whether it be a program you're running on your machine, whatever, um, you want to focus on the bottleneck because if you optimize code outside of that bottleneck, it's not going to make a difference. It's just going to be dwarfed by the amount of time that your code is spending in that bottleneck. Um, and so, but if you optimize your bottleneck, right, uh, that can be huge. They can have huge effects on the runtime of your algorithm. Um, and, uh, you know, you can kind of imagine this, like, as the numbers get big, if you cut down on, you know, let's say, like, we initialize this array a little bit better, or we, you know, do some, ignore some, like, extra string operations that are in the setup of this function, right? It might look good and feel good to, like, clean out some of that code, you know, because it's, like, refactoring makes it more pretty, uh, makes it do less dumb stuff. Um, but it actually doesn't really make a difference in runtime. Like, it just it ends up not mattering at all if you cut down non-bottleneck code. Um, but if you cut down on the bottleneck code, like if you can go into like your doubly nested for loop and speed something up and be like, oh yeah, you know what, we can do this thing here. Or like, you know, you can reuse this index rather than have to compute it again. Um, that can end up speeding up your program really significantly, right? Uh, you can basically reduce like that, that coefficient, uh, which we, we, you know, we've been ignoring that coefficient up till now. But you can, if you're thinking about that coefficient, you can, you know, bring it down like 30%, 50%, um, even if you're still growing at you know, the same on factor or on squared factor, uh, and that will make your code run much, much faster. But only if you focus on the bottleneck. If you focus on non-bottleneck code, it won't make a difference. Um, and of course, best of all would be if you can lower the time complexity altogether, right? So if you look at the bottleneck and you're like, okay, so this is an n squared bottleneck, um, how can I make it better than n squared, right? How can I make it linear? Uh, and then once you solve that, then your, your code is just gonna be totally, totally different. 
Uh, and you'll have new bottlenecks that you'll have to look at, uh, and it's going to run order of magnitudes faster. So uh, that's bottleneck. Uh, we're going to go ahead and do a bottleneck exercise real quick. Um, this will also allow me to take a break to drink some water because I'm very parched. Um, so if you guys can take a look at the uh, GitHub repo, there's a bottleneck identification file, uh, which you can take a look at. Uh, and hopefully here you can, you can see all of this on the screen. Uh, if someone can post the link in the chat, that'd be really awesome. Um, <clears throat> so there's this function here called contain all, contains all letters that checks to see if a string contains all the letters. Um, and uh, what I want you to do is I want you to find where the bottleneck is. Okay, so you tell me, just you know, leave a comment, where's the bottleneck? Um, and if you figure it out, ideally, see if you can improve it uh, and make the bottleneck kind of change and go somewhere else. Um, so this is going to be the function. Uh, I'm going to take a very quick break and get some water. Um, and uh, yeah, if you have any questions, just uh, shoot them in the chat and I'll see them uh, once I... Once I get back, so let me change this to be. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Here we go. Cool. Okay. So uh, be right back, guys. Uh, by the way, if you haven't already, uh, I would strongly encourage you to uh, <clears throat> to take a break, go get a drink, uh, you know, get a drink of water, go to the bathroom, do whatever you need to do. Stand up and stretch because this has been we've been sitting here for a while, and sitting too long is not good for your for your soul. So uh, I'm going to go walk around a little bit, and then we'll be back, and we'll go over the ball night thing. So uh, let's say like five minutes. Does that sounds good with folks, or five, ten minutes? Okay. Cool, cool. Ah. <clears throat> Where do you go online for the information? Uh, let me let me uh, try to provide some links afterward. Um, that hopefully will be will be uh, helpful for that. <clears throat> Yeah. Cool. All right.
<sighs> Is that any better, guys? Awesome. Okay, how are we all doing? <clears throat> any feelings on how it's going so far? Okay. Wow, we are uh, yeah, we are for a little bit, huh? A bomb exercise. Okay. Uh, so we're a little bit well, we're a little behind, but that's fine. <clears throat> so I guess the uh, just so you guys know, the approximate time I'm guessing this is going to take is maybe like another uh, hour and a half, maybe more. So if you're down for it, let's uh, let's keep rolling through. Okay, so, uh, so this, this is fun. People are people are posting some of their guesses. Uh, if you can't actually go ahead and go ahead and post your guess in the in the chat if you're feeling uh, a little bit confident. Um, and let's see what uh, what people think the the bottleneck is in this function that we've got here. <clears throat> Anyone else? Just the just those two. Oh, neck is n squared. So I'm looking for, okay, yeah. Um, well, I think I feel like it's enough time now. So if everyone's ready, uh, we get to jump back into things. Mm. You good to go? Ah, ha, ha. People are talking about hashes. Cool. All right. So let's uh, go ahead and get back into it. Um, so I'm going to screen share. Uh, that is going to be. Good time. Okay. All right. So, <clears throat> so where's the bottleneck here? Uh, so right here we've got this unique letters array. So this is actually kind of an interesting problem. Um, it's 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 a kind of way of analyzing time complexity that is not super common, but it's actually uh, an important way to to think. So, um, so this we've got this unique letters thing, right? Because we want to know uh, all of the unique letters in this. Thing. So let's just walk through the function so everyone understands it. Um, so we're we want to find all the unique letters inside the string, and uh, for now, I'll just trust that this subroutine does that. Uh, then what it does, it sorts the unique letters, and uh, it's in an array of characters. Um, and after it sorts the unique letters, it joins them together into an array. Uh, then it makes them all lowercase and it trims it so in case there's like any spaces in the sentence um, It'll it'll get rid of those um, And it'll only leave Well, uh, if you have other symbols it might kind of mess up, but let's assume it's only spaces and letters um, It'll get rid of all the spaces and it'll just have the letters and uh, The letters should be equal to if it contains every letter it should be equal to this string right here And so it should return sorted letters triple equals alphabet Okay, so there are a few interesting things going on here, right? Now, one thing you might remember is that sorting takes n log n time, right? So that essentially, essentially a bad sign there. Uh, this unique letters dot join dot lowercase dot trim. This thing will take o n time in the length of the uh, the array. So this would be o n, um, and then these equality checks right here would just be in the, you know in the length of the alphabet, right? Um, Okay, now what about this stuff in here? Okay, so initializing this array, that takes a one time. Uh, then you have this for loop that goes, you know, uh, n many times. And then what it does, it says uh, unique letters dot index of string of i is equal to negative one. Basically meaning that the, uh, the character here, this character that's at this index, is not in the unique letters already. If it is, push it into the, uh, into the array of unique letters. Okay, so some people are saying that uh, they believe that this right here is the bottleneck, this index of, okay? And uh, it's interesting because, you know, this unique letters thing, uh, and this, this is probably the place where, where I would initially go to, because what it's doing is it's creating this array, right? So it's like, you know, uh, A, or well, this, we'll make it P, oops, come on, come on. 
P H E, and then there's a Q, and then there's a U, uh, right? And this is sort of filling up as the quick fox, quick fox stuff with lazy dogs. Um, but it's making sure that it's not putting duplicates in there, right? Uh, and that's the reason why, in order to make sure I'm not inserting a duplicate, uh, I've got to check to see and, and kind of do a linear scan, right? I've got to kind of got to scan from left to right. Hey, as I'm putting in this C, or sorry, this I, as the next letter in quick, uh, I've got to make sure I don't already have an I in there. And the only way to do that is to scan left to right, right? That's what index of is doing. It's scanned from left to right. Uh, checking the index of takes linear time in the length of the array. So uh, to, to ensure that I don't already have it in there, that takes linear time in the length of unique letters. Um, and so that, you know, this thing is taking O n time times the length of unique letters. Um, and, you know, that must be n squared, right? Um, so, <clears throat> so a lot of people mentioned that they think this is n squared. Now, this is not exactly n squared, okay? And this is kind of a trick. I kind of played a trick on you all, uh, which I'm sure everyone's very happy to hear. Uh, this is not necessarily n squared. This is n times the length of the unique letters array. Okay, what is going to be the maximum length of the unique letters array? Does anyone want to take a shot at what the maximum length is going to be there? Is it going to scale with n? Uh, yeah. So someone, uh, I guess Patrick already mentioned uh, the if you have purely English letters. And the maximum size that this can be is 26, right? There's no way that unique letters can be more than 26 characters. Otherwise, something is fundamentally broken about the way that I'm approaching this algorithm. Um, so I must assume then that unique letters is 26 characters. Um, well, you don't have to assume that, actually. We'll talk about that. Okay, so unique letters is 26. So this is n times 26, okay? This is an on uh, algorithm here. Uh, and then uh, this right here, you know, th this sorts the unique letters, but the unique letters are only 26 characters long at most. It might have less than 26 characters because it might not have everything in the alphabet, but sorting this array of at most 26 elements, even though that's n log n, it's actually k log k, where k is the constant size that's 26, right? Uh, if you're assuming English letters. So <clears throat> this becomes k log k, uh, or like, you know, 26 log 26, which is constant. This is like a number, right? This is just like, I don't know, 50 or something. So this is constant. So this sorting this thing is constant. This thing is constant because this can only be, you know, the array can only be a certain size. Uh, and this, you know, whatever this stuff right here is constant as well. And so in fact, the bottleneck is everything in here. All of this stuff going on in here is the bottleneck um, because this is the stuff that's happening O-N many times. This for loop is our bottleneck. Everything in here is O1. Everything, uh, uh, this actual index of is O1, and the pushing into this thing is O1. Uh, so this is actually kind of a trick question, because it, it really seems like, oh, there's like this O-N squared thing that's going on inside. But because I'm, of course, you know, assuming an English alphabet, uh, this is, this must be an O-N algorithm, and, but, but this for loop is the bottleneck. So does that make sense? Does everyone understand uh, why uh, it's not n squared. This kind of uh, kind of makes sense. Awesome. Cool. So uh, now, if you want to be super technical, uh, the way that you would actually describe an algorithm like this. So this is this is kind of dumb. Um, this you know alphabet equals a b c d whatever. Um, the way you would actually usually describe it, you'd say this is n is o n times a, where a is the size of the alphabet. Right. So this actually kind of would be quadratic, although technically, like, I'm defining the alphabet sort of in, uh, like, I'm kind of uh, hard coding in the alphabet. But if you, you know, were to extend this to, like, include any alphabet, like, let's say you were not just using ASCII characters, but you were also using, like, Japanese characters or, uh, you know, different, you know, some other different encoding of many, many different characters. Um, <clears throat> then, in fact, whatever the size of that alphabet was, is how long this unique letters thing would be. And this would become, you know, this k log k, instead of being k log k, would actually be a log a, where a is the size of the alphabet, right? And so then there are actually potentially two bottlenecks if you do that. So we're not going to go that deep into this, but there might be two bottlenecks here because this would be, uh, this would be n times a, this would be n times the size of the alphabet, and this would be a log a, which is a, where a is the size of the alphabet. And how do you know which of the two is bigger? You actually don't. So uh, if this thing, uh, if the alphabet were, 
and not fixed. So basically, they're a dynamic alphabet. Then the actual runtime would be n times a plus a log a. Does that does that kind of make sense? So this is again like super <laughs> getting, getting kind of out of the scope of what we're you know literally looking at right here on the page. Um, but this is the you know this is kind of the way that you analyze uh, an algorithm like this to be um, to be super super exhaustive in your explanation. Cool. Any questions? Any any anything someone's dying to ask before we move on? I will assume from the silence that that is a no. Uh, so Casey says wait. Okay, so we're gonna wait for Casey. Uh, what's up, Casey? Casey is apologizing. Casey, it's okay. I forgive you. Um, Kirk asks, "How would you improve it?" Uh, okay, so Casey asks, "Join, create a new array." Yes, it does. Uh, Kirk asks, "How would you improve it?" Uh, so that's a great question. Um, so the way that you'd want to improve this algorithm, so a lot of people mentioned this already, is you would use a um, you would use a hash map instead of uh, instead of this array here. Um, or basically, you use a hash set of some kind. Um, in JavaScript, you'd probably just use an object, uh, use an object literal, um, and use that. And basically, basically, you have the string characters be the keys. Um, but you would use some kind of hash map structure so you can look up in O1 time rather than in uh, OA time, where A is the uh, length of the alphabet. <clears throat> cool. Um, do do do. Not only can also be the loop because the string could be a whole book where the first sentences can include the entire alphabet. Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the loop is definitely uh, bottleneck. Um, cool. Okay. So someone wrote a crazy function that I'm not going to be able to parse. Uh, just saying it that way. <laughs> I think they wrote some crazy one liner. Um, beautiful, Roger. Beautiful. All right. So let's move on. So everyone's happy now. Uh, don't be a bottleneck, guys. Uh, and if you're trying to fix up an algorithm, you know, uh, fix it. Uh, in the bottleneck, not outside the bottleneck. Uh, <clears throat> okay, cool. So let's uh, let's talk real quick about space complexity. So we've talked so far about time complexity. Okay, and that's what Big O is is generally used to describe. Uh, but you can also use Big O to describe the space complexity. Right uh, now, space complexity is the same thing, very same thing, except now we're talking about memory or space instead of time. So how much space does this algorithm take or require you to allocate? Um, so for example, do you take linear extra space relative to the size of the input, right? So uh, you know, a good way to think about space complexity is are you uh, allocating new arrays? Uh, do you have to make a copy of the original input? Are you creating nested data structures? Uh, if so, you, you might have really bad space complexity. Um, so space complexity, I think, is pretty simple. Once you get the general idea, so let's just do a quick comprehension check. Okay, so this will be an activity that I want you guys to take part in. We looked at these algorithms already. Um, so, what is going to be the space complexity of the max function? Okay, um, so let's take a look real quickly at max. Uh, I guess I'm going to do this with you guys. Um, so, let's look at max. Okay, so here's max right here. So, uh, someone tell me what they think the space complexity of max is. Uh, okay, Patrick says it's constant. Patrick, why do you think that max is constant? <clears throat> so Patrick says, no matter how big the array gets, we're only assigning one max. Correct. So uh, if you literally look at the space we're taking, what are the variables we're, uh, we're, we're creating, right? We're creating this current max variable, which is assigned a value, which will presumably be an integer, right? Uh, we're assigning this iterator, and this iterator is going to keep moving. But so far, we have two variables. They're each numbers. Um, and there are no other new memory allocations, right? We, we will be assigning this thing, but it's taking up the same space the old one was taking up. So basically, we only have – no, so no. Very good question, Stephen. We do not count the input because the question is how much extra memory does our algorithm require to run? The input already exists by definition, right? Otherwise, you couldn't pass it into the function. Uh, the question is, how much new memory do I need to run your algorithm? If it takes quadratic memory, then it's like, well, that's a shitload of memory. I don't have that kind of memory, right? Um, but you know, there are algorithms that even if you have a big input, might take O1 memory, right? So max is a good example of that, where 
I only need to allocate two variables, and the variables just point to integers, right? And that's it. I don't need anything else. I just need two variables. No matter how big your array is, two variables will solve the problem for me. I just need a max and an, integer, and, uh, an iterator. So that's why max here is O1. Um, so Yu Yang says, I think the worst scenario is still ON. So can you explain what you mean, uh, Yu Yang? Um, so we're talking about memory here, to be clear. We're not talking about time. So max definitely takes ON time. Um, but we're talking about the space complexity, the amount of space that it takes. Uh, and it seems like now he understands. Cool. Uh, he or she, I can't actually see. Um, cool. OK, so that's max. Uh, so that's ON. So what about first five? So let's take a look at first five. Uh, OK. So what uh, does someone think the space complexity of first five is? Anyone want to take a shot? Someone who did not already answer? <clears throat> How much extra space do you think this thing takes? Five. So Bard says five. So Bard, why do you say five? <clears throat> So it says, uh, because it turns five characters, or all five of whatever's in the array. Uh, yes, you're absolutely right. So basically, this array that gets allocated needs to be needs to have five things in it. Uh, we push things into this new array, and then we return this array. So we have two allocations. We have this, this, uh, this array, and then this iterator, right? So we just have these two elements that we declare. The iterator, of course, goes away. And this array will only ever be size five. No matter how big the original input is, this thing will only ever be size five. So we would actually say, so we would not say that the amount of memory this takes is five, but we'd rather say it's O1, right? This would be O1 space or O1 memory. Um, almost always anything that's O1, an O1 algorithm will, uh, like O1 time algorithm, will pretty much always also be O1 space. Um, it would be kind of strange to have an O1 time algorithm that constructs something that takes O and memory. Uh, that's basically impossible. Um, but uh, yes, so O1, uh, O1 time and O1 space for first five. All right, so what about substrings? So this is, this is, this is, this is a fun one. Uh, so what do people think about substrings? What is the space complexity of the substrings one? So if you remember, I, I gave you this argument why this is ON cubed. Um, but what do you think the space complexity is? Like how much memory do I need to allocate when I run this, uh, this function? <clears throat> Someone new again. Patrick, I know, I know. You can't get all the glory. We got to spread it around. <clears throat> anybody? Anybody want to take a guess? Okay, so you think it's O N. So you, why do you think it's O N? Let's see what you. Let's see what you want to say. Uh, because the maximum is string dot length. Okay, so it's not quite right because uh, if you remember. This uh, substrings array, because I have this doubly nested loop, right? There are going to be quadratically many combinations. Oh, excuse me. There are going to be quadratically many combinations of substrings because a substring is just defined by a start index and an end index. Uh, let me grab a tissue real quick. Sorry, one second. Uh, boy, oh boy. Yeah, so this array, once we insert all of the substrings into it, is going to have uh, quadratically many things in it. So we need at least quadratic space for all for that array to be that big, right? But we also need another linear factor of space because each of the substrings in that new array is going to be on average uh, on length, right? Because we we already talked about before, I think more than once that the average length of the substring is linear in the length of the string. So the output, basically the, the, the amount of memory we need to allocate in generating this output is actually also on cubed. Um, so that's why this is uh, a little bit tricky, but uh, if you think about, if you just think about like how big does the output need to be? Well, it needs to be on cubed, right? Because it needs to be quadratically many strings. Strings take on space, so it must be on cubed. Does that make sense? Do you follow that? Substrings, cubic space, is that all good? Um, how does the fact that there's no duplicates modify the bigger equation? 
Okay. Uh, so it seems like people not totally understanding, so maybe I can go back and try to explain a little bit more. So Roger asks, how does the fact there's no duplicates modify the big O equation? Uh, are you saying that when I, uh, so it actually doesn't. Uh, it turns out, uh, and this is something we can maybe talk about afterwards. Uh, turns out even if you don't, so what, he's, uh, what Roger is referring to here is that I'm not doing J equals zero, right? If I did J equals zero, then they would literally be, I would get like zero and one and then one and zero uh, in different iterations of this loop. Because I'm doing J equals I plus one inside this nested loop, J and I are never going to be equal. It will always be different. Uh, and it's good because basically I don't have duplicates. Uh, essentially, Roger, what that does is it divides the number in half, right? Because if you think about it, uh, <clears throat> to, to, to eliminate all the duplicates, uh, for every, like, you know, let's say I have the substring from, you know, three to five, and then I also later get the substring from five to three, right? And when I say five to three, I mean, like, you know, if I have hello world, uh, I get the substring from, let's see, index three is here, and index five is here, right? So I get like this substring, and then later I'll get the substring from three to five, and then the next time I'll get it from five to three. Well, there are only two ways to make that substring, right? Either I go from three to five, or I go sort of backwards from five to three as another combination of like start and end indexes for the string. Um, and of course, it'll never go backwards, right? Um, so if that, if I if I get that, then well, first of all, actually, string dot slice is not really going to work because uh, I don't think you, you can slice backwards. Can you slice backwards? I think it'll just give you an empty string. Um, yeah, yeah, I didn't think so. Um, but uh, yeah, so basically, because I don't, like basically I'm cutting the number of iterations in half if I don't have duplicates. So that just divides that n squared by two, but it doesn't actually you know, change the, the fact that it's quadratic, if that makes sense. So that's kind of the intuition why uh, it's, it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't really make a difference. Um, cool, so uh, Casey, says that it doesn't quite make sense. Um, is there anything I can do? Anybody else not understand that I, I can maybe help clarify uh, why the substrings is cubic? Just to go over really briefly one more time, uh, because there are quadratically many substrings, which we established before because it's nested loop. It's nested loop creates every substring. Um, so I've got to at least have quadratic space in an array, but inside that array, there've got to be other stuff. Um, yes, the total number of substrings is n squared. And inside of that array though, each of the substrings, I have to allocate them too, right? I don't just have an array with n spots in it, uh, or sorry, of n squared spots in it. I also need to fill them with strings that I create. And those strings on average will be length n because uh, they're actually technically one third n, but we drop the one third factor. Um, so the total number, the total space that this will take will be O n cubed because it's quadratic uh, and then uh, quadratic with many strings of on space, exactly. Uh, yes, space is counted by character, absolutely, yes. Um, yeah, good question. Space is counted by character when you're, when you're talking about strings uh, or arrays where it'd be sort of elements. Um, so RH asks, when you push into an array, does it make a copy of the string? Um, so I'm not sure which string you're referring to. Um, oh, you, when you mean string dot slice from i to j, is that what you're referring to, RH? Uh, in which case, if that's, what you, if that's what you mean, then yes. Yes, it does. Uh, it creates a new, uh, a new string object that is a copy of that string from i to j. Um, yes, cool. Okay, uh, and finally, we're going to look at has vowel. Okay, so has vowel here. Uh, so this, this is an interesting one. It uh, looks like it kind of cut off. There we go. So has vowel. Uh, so you split the string, right, and you check to see if any of them have uh, index of char to two lowercase. Okay, cool. So who thinks they know the time, the space complexity of Hasval? We already established the time complexity is n. What do you think the space complexity is? <clears throat> Anybody have an idea? Okay, so Arnaud thinks it's O1. So Arnaud, why do you think the space complexity here is O1? So we got a couple of a couple of ones, but uh, or not was first to the punch. We don't allocate any variable. Oh, so we got some disagreement. Okay, interesting. Uh, this I like this. Okay. So this is so or not says this is this is O one because we don't allocate any variables, right? Um, so this is actually not correct. It's not correct. 
Um, turns out this is ON space, okay? And uh, there are two reasons why this is ON space. Now, one reason is kind of, is kind of bullshit. Uh, so one reason is that string.split creates a new array, right? That creates an array of characters, and you have to create a new string for each of the characters in there, right? So that's ON. But you could totally do this without doing that, right? You could just have a for loop that iterates over the string and looks at each character, yeah? So, uh, you know, you might say that, well, okay, fine, you know, it's, it's uh, technically because of the split, it's all end. But the rest of it, we're not assigning any variables, right? So if you just if you did a for loop instead of the split, uh, maybe it would be 01. But actually, it's still not 01 space, okay? And uh, the reason why it's not 01 space um, is actually, wait, no, I'm sorry. It would be 01 space. If you use a for loop to iterate over the uh, to iterate over the string, um, then it would be O one space, because inside of here, um, so you are actually allocating space though, right? And the space that you're allocating is you're declaring this new string every single time you create a new string. Uh, so this string literal takes up space, and you check inside of that string literal whether or not the character that you're iterating over is in the string, right? Um, so you you know we might be able to write this this way. We might be able to say uh, you know for uh, let's say let i equals zero, i is less than string dot length, i plus plus, and we might say uh, you know um, let char equals string at i, and we might say you know basically we check to see if this is true, and if it's true, uh, then we return true, uh, and if it's if it goes all the way to the end, then we return false, right? So you'd say if you do you'd say if this AI you didn't make some chart of two lowercase uh, is greater than or equal to zero, then return true. Uh, and if that never happens, then we return false. Right? So this would be another way of doing this so that it now takes O1 space. So without the split, uh, even though we're out, so we the thing is like here's 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 one I think very valid question. As we iterate over this string, we are actually creating this string again and again and again and again. You might notice that. Uh, hopefully you do. Is that because this is like, we're not saving the string. We're not saying like, you know, uh, let alpha or let, you know, vowels equal AIOU and putting vowels here, right? This would be, this would be better. We should probably do this so we don't create a bunch of objects. But doing it this way, uh, we do create a bunch of objects, okay? But it's still O1. And the reason why it's O1 is because of garbage collection, okay? Even though on each iteration we're creating a new AEIOU, uh, the garbage collector will only let us allocate so many AEIOUs before it cleans them up. Does that make sense? So basically, like there's an upper bound on the number of AIOUs that will get created uh, as this thing runs like a million times, right? Or if, if I becomes or the length of the string becomes like 10 million or a billion or whatever, um, it's not going to run out of memory because the garbage collector will eventually just throw away. Uh, it'll it'll run periodically and throw away the the unused string literals that we keep creating. So, um, yeah. So basically, that's why this is O one, even though technically we're creating a lot of string literals. So it's kind of it's kind of subtle. Um, <clears throat> so Casey asks, how about a language without garbage collection? In a language without garbage collection, you have to garbage collect the AIOU yourself. If you don't, then you are creating a memory leak, and then it would become O n. Um, uh, but if uh, oh, Bard says, just saw a message on the meetup that someone's waiting at the door. So you New York folks, if someone's waiting at the door, please let them in. Uh, we, oh, cool. Perfect. Uh, yes. So this is now 01 if you, if you don't have uh, automatic garbage collection. So Stephen mentions a Java with a string constants pool. Um, so actually, I, believe, I suspect that JavaScript also does string interning. I know that Python does as well for short, uh, for short strings. Um, so string and turning is basically, well, it's a complicated thing, let's not talk about it, it's kind of a rabbit hole, but with string and turning, you actually, even though you have the string literal, you would actually not create a new string, you would just have a reference to the old one. Um, so I suspect that V8 actually probably does that, but not necessarily every JavaScript runtime does string and turning. So it depends on the runtime that you're using. Um, so a little bit complicated, but just for, as a general kind of, uh, you know, rule of thumb, uh, you know, if, you, if you're making an array instead of a, a string, then you would not have the advantage of string sort of the string constants rule or string interning, um, as, as it's known in sort of more generally. Um, but same principle, basically. Creating a, bunch of, creating a bunch of objects doesn't necessarily mean 
that you're taking more memory. Cool? Does that all make sense? Everyone, everyone down with space complexity? Any questions before we move on? Uh, so Kate says, in summary, it's 01 if you use a for loop. Well, uh, not always. It depends on if you're like uh, adding to an array or like building a bigger object. The, the fundamental thing is like, are you building a really big object? Or are you just using a lot of objects once and throwing them away? If you're using a lot of objects once and throwing them away, then it's probably 01. If you're building a big object, then it's probably ON. So that's that's the easiest way to think about it. <clears throat> so Ned asks if I can say again about the garbage collection. Um, so uh, so about garbage collection, so I, actually, I don't want to go into too much detail about this because it's kind of a detour. Um, but uh, ask me again toward the end of, uh, during the Q&A, and maybe I can talk more about that. Uh, Patrick asks about, Subsets versus substrings. Uh, let, let, let me hold that for the Q&A as well, because it's kind of a, a totally separate thing as well. But, but feel free to ask me that once we get to the Q&A. Cool. So let's move on. So let's talk about memory. Uh, what the hell is memory, uh, and why am I bothering you about it? So to understand memory, we need to first understand how a computer is structured. Okay, so this is going to be the first part of our kind of deeper dive into understanding how a computer works at the fundamental level. Because um, you really need to understand that in order to really understand what an algorithm does to be uh, memory efficient or memory inefficient. Okay. Um, actually, one thing that I think we need to do, because we're running close to uh, 90 minutes, um, what I'm going to go ahead and do, let's take like a super quick break, maybe like five minutes, and I'm going to try to move to a new session because we have to move to a new session anyway after 90 minutes. Um, so is everyone cool with taking a quick break? Everyone down for that? Okay, cool. Uh, yes, yeah, so let's take a quick five minutes. Uh, you know, do your thing, whatever, whatever you feel, and I will try to get us set up in a new session. Um, Alex Hannon asks, "How long past five do you think we'll be going? Um, what time is it right now in in New York? Is it four, four forty two? Yes, I will share my slides afterwards. I, I don't, I haven't had time before because I was kind of getting them set up right before this." Uh, but I'll, I'll definitely share them, and I'll send out a link afterwards to everyone who attended. Uh, so, okay, so it's five now. I would guess maybe like another, oh, man, maybe like 45 minutes to an hour until we hit the Q&A. That's just like a guess. Um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, all right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill this, and I'm going to try to set up a new session. Hopefully, we'll all be happy, and we'll arrive there safely. So I'll see you guys in a second. Mm, okay, I see. 